Now it's time for my panel of financial experts with, with real deep knowledge of ESG, way deeper knowledge than I have, but we're going we're gonna to play with this of ESG investing and strategies. Tiffany McGee is the founder, CEO, and CIO of Pivotal Advisors, an investment firm with an ESG lens, and she's also a CNBC commentator. Anut Shah is the partner and head of U.S. and U.K. at KKS Advisors, which advises leading organizations on sustainable strategies. And Todd Court is a lecturer in sustainability at Yale School of Management. He also serves as faculty co-director of the Yale Center for Business Environment. It's great to have all of you here, uh, and I want to have fun with this topic, hope we can. But let me start with Tiffany. Tiffany, you're all over this topic. I mean, one of the things I found really interesting, I think, unless I misread my material here, you actually have sort of, um, you know, chief ESG officers for loan, right? Or you kind of help place them uh, in various companies. So I'm trying to demystify and, and create a layperson's understanding of the ESG world. And a part of it is coming to kind of describe to our audience what we really mean. So can you help us understand how when you're talking to lay folks out there and you're even placing folks in their companies so that they can lead them, how do you define ESG? Yes, yeah, so so um, so we're we're actually not placing people. So um, oops. my firm. Well, oh, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, uh, I just my, said oops. Firm, <laughs> oh, sorry, it's okay. <laughs> so my firm, uh, Pivotal Advisors, and, and I can see how you how you may have gotten confused. So we're what's called an OCIO firm, so an, an outsourced chief investment officer firm. It's just right. a fancy way of saying that we manage investment portfolios for um, institutional clients. So we manage their entire portfolio. Right. So with uh, for foundations, endowments, uh, some institutional retirement plans and some um, uh, uh, structured family offices. Right. So this is what we do for institutional clients. And so we do consider ESG factors when we're making investment decisions. And just to kind of level set, um, a lot of people think that ESG is uh, socially conscious investing or values investing. And so while it can be, it really that really isn't the definition. So really what ESG investing is, is utilizing, um, really uh, considering the responsible environmental, social, and governance metrics of companies, individual companies, or of um, investment strategies, and taking those, those metrics and lining them up alongside the traditional financial metrics that us as investors um, would use to make an investment decision. Really nerdy things like standard deviation and alpha, beta, R squared, sharp ratio, blah, blah, blah. So we take these metrics, we line them up alongside these traditional financial metrics. And the idea here is that um, you know, metrics like uh, how a company um, respond, uh, responded to COVID-19, right? How did they treat their employees? Did they, did they prioritize their, their um, employee safety and their customer safety, um, right. diversity, all of these things? Um, it, the identification of those factors um, tend to lead to, to the identification of companies with strong management and companies with strong management uh, tend to to make better decisions and do well. And there's some other factors in there as well. There are other ways to kind of measure these things. And the ultimate goal is to find ways to mitigate to mitigate the risk in investment portfolio and also identify opportunities for excess return. And there are a number of ways to do that with these metrics. I really appreciate that. Todd, um, I think one of the things I've been trying to get my head around is the fungibility and the fuzzability of some of the topics that are part of the ESG portfolio, also who's in and who's out. And I guess my question to you is kind of a bottom line one. I, I hear a lot of advocates for ESG that they think it really does uh, uh, impact profitability. It does impact the bottom line. It does produce you know, good uh, uh, public goods corrections and contributions. What is your view of it? And is there a slippery slope in this that we're not seeing? So ESG encompasses a number of investment strategies, but the main one we think of is called ESG integration, hmm. which is just as Tiffany is saying, it's the ability to use environmental and social risks to identify opportunities or things that the company needs to avoid. Um, so that is inherently profit driven. So that is about how companies are going to manage their company better to you know, address climate change challenges, et cetera. There are a number of other, of other strategies. So there's divestment strategies. There's shareholder activism strategies. Not all of these investment strategies are as profit oriented. So you can get yourself into an ESG investment strategy that is not necessarily targeted at maximizing profit. 
you might want to maximize your environmental return, for example, hmm. um, and, and create benefit to society. So the, the definition allows for a bit of a slippery slope inherently in that you can, you can target your money at different, different strategies within the investment world. Um, but the, the challenge right now, very quickly, is that sometimes it can be hard to define which strategy you're in. And it's, it's, it's incumbent on the asset manager to really make that clear to investors to say, this is what we're targeting in this investment category. It's either making money or creating environmental benefit or what have you. I, I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me. Anuj, when I, one of the um, topics that is, you know, part of our discussion is, you know, how you begin thinking about what's your universe of participants, right? If, if you know, sometimes if you have everyone in, in the camp, then you've got no one, right? But if you, if it's the question of who's in, who's out. And a lot of times I'm wondering whether our, or at least the public's, calculations and assessments of that are different than they need to be from an economic perspective. And so when it comes to screening, when it comes to looking at behavior, I'm, I'm someone who says, you know, I like talking to odd bedfellows and bringing them in to understand my side, but what's your sense of screening and, and the risks of excluding companies because they have been somehow tainted or look at this, say take oil companies, for instance. I keep telling Certainly. my friends at the and Rockefeller Foundation they were based on a lot of oil profits. <laughs> and it's a great question, Steve. And I think typically the conversation sort of thinks about this as, as two different options, right? You have divestment. And then if we talk about on the other bookend, it's, you know, we're actually not necessarily concer concerned with the ESG and we will look for companies that can maximize profit and right. returns to our shareholders. And within those two bookends, there's typically a lot of nuance, right, as, as, there, as there is. And what we're seeing from our clients is, number one, an evolution on a divestment policy. Quite literally, there's an asterisk now that we are seeing on, on, on divestment policies that says when they recognize that a firm that was traditionally operating in the fossil fuel business or derives a majority of its revenues from fossil fuels is demonstrated a commitment to transition uh, to renewable energy that we reserve the right to essentially invest in those firms and they are tracking those. Um, and then on the other side of this, we also see a conversation with our investor clients, which is they are active engagers. What they'd like to see is certainly have an opportunity to invest in these businesses, but to work with them through active engagement in setting a transition plan. And that transition plan has a goal, a timeline, a time horizon on it, and you're setting metrics and KPIs that you can measure in terms of the, that firm's success in transitioning. And you reserve the right, as an asset manager does, um, to exit that investment if you don't see that organization achieving those targets. So we really see that there is a certain amount of nuance and increasing recognition amongst advisors that there are opportunities for, for, for firms um, to be a part of this transition to renewables. Is there anyone that's done it really well as you kind of talk at this little models or efforts that you've sort of seen in transitions that we can talk about um, that are public that you, you can point to? Sure, there's a couple of firms um, that have what you want to see also is that at the top and that there are public statements from those organizations. Um, so there are a couple of energy companies that we've seen. Um, Equinor uh, is one example of a firm. Uh, that the CEO has really said that they want their organization to lead in this transition to renewables, um, and it's commendable. And they are committed, and they have a very transparent and open transition plan, and you can track the metrics. So that's one mm -hmm. example of a firm that uh, you know we're, we're watching. It's fantastic. It's very interesting. I, I used to know a guy named David Crane, who was CEO of NRG, energy and he was very committed to renewables and so committed he got escorted out of the company but it's you know i think it's you know sort of an interesting things and you know tiffany i'd, I'd love to kind of get your sense too you know there's oil there's tobacco i'm sure there are other players in this and you've you i know you have some thoughts on where that dial needs to be set on uh exclusion or inclusion what are your thoughts on screens yeah, so I, I, we, we think about ESG integration um, in, in a little bit more broadly, right? So um, on, on one hand, 
when we when we as investors are looking for opportunities um, or, or constructing a portfolio for our clients, uh, we're looking um, because we invest in both funds, uh, you know, investment strategies and also individual stocks. We're looking at um, metrics across the E, the S and the G from an individual stock perspective, um, as well as from uh, an overall portfolio perspective, uh, for instance, in, in a mutual fund. But it's very important to understand two things. Uh, the first is um, uh, the definition of um, these ESG metrics uh, by whoever it is who is constructing these, um, uh, these, these investment strategies, right? So it's almost like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well, you know, these, these definitions are also in the, behind, in the eye of the beholder. And it's also important, secondly, for um, investors to understand how exclusionary strategies affect the investment portfolio. So, so long-term uh, exclusionary strategies tend to really not um, have a major effect uh, on, on the overall investment portfolio, but will so um, quite possibly in the short term. But every metric is different. So, you know, whether you're excluding um, tobacco or firearms or, or anything like that, each metric exclusion uh, will will affect um, a different type of company, right? So maybe um, uh, utility exclusions, energy exclusions, um, or, you know, um, uh, um, energy exclusions or utility exclusions will, will affect, um, you know, certain companies that have that that actually uh, sorry pay out um, higher dividends, right? So if you're going to do a screen for firearms, so you know you might um, you know end up screening out more companies um, than than what you would expect if you're if you're utilizing uh, exclusionary strategy that is excluding companies that have any relation to to firearms, right? And not just the firearm companies themselves. Hmm. So how you go about it is just as important um, is as understanding the effects that each of these exclusionary uh, factors have on different types of companies. Um, so yeah, the understanding of that is incredibly important. You know, I, I want to say to all of you, and Anuj, it's one of these fascinating topics I find myself, I interviewed a woman named Vicki Holub yesterday, who's the CEO of Occidental. There's a lot about Occidental I don't know and tell the public. I don't know a lot. You know, I don't know, you know the dark stuff. But I, she's going to build the world's largest direct air carbon capture system, which we don't have in the world today. It's going to be enormous and significant in the beginning of the trend. And the, and, the committee, and the company is committed to be net zero in emissions by 2040. So she's 10 years ahead of a lot of her other folks that are in this. Now, I don't, you know, we're talking about measurement, we're talking about this stuff, or, you know, I'm not going to talk about our, our, our sponsor today, but you kind of look at some companies that say, hey, you know, if you move from smoke progress to unsmoked products, you see that happening in Japan today, see health impacts, you know, going on. You know, I, I, I'm just wondering whether we have the creative aperture, the open enough aperture to consider these various things of, you know, players that you would argue did bad in the world are doing less bad in the world. And is that uh, an opportunity or is that a delusion? Uh, Anuj, and I'll just ask all of you, uh, Anuj. Sure. So I think what we're seeing from the work that we do with our clients is that those investors are certainly open to that. What is necessary, though, is the production of metrics that those investors can hmm. use to make that assessment whether that organization is authentically committed to the transition to a more sustainable society. So those metrics um, don't necessarily exist. Uh, so we're sort of looking into business transformation metrics at our organization, defining what those could look like and whether that could be part of the solution for investors to have access to these transformation type metrics so they can see mm. a company's progress towards those goals. Thank you. Todd, your thoughts? Yeah. So from a financial perspective, what we want to avoid is the company that is going to implode because of some environmental and social risk, right? So mm. this Occidental is a good example. If you believe that oil and gas is doomed over the over some time period, then you either want to get away from oil and gas companies, which is divestment, hmm. or you want to find those oil and gas companies that will successfully navigate the transition, in which right. case you want to find those oil and gas companies because those are going to be the winners of tomorrow. And that's where this, these two strategies start to, to start to combine or, or hmm. overlap. So for Occidental, you might believe that they're the transition king, and therefore you should get in hmm. while you can because they're going to dominate the market with their direct air capture technology. 
or you might believe that their main revenue source is going to dry up as regulations come down on carbon taxes, for example. Mm. So it's all up to, the, up to the investment strategy and which you think is the right play to maximize your returns. Fascinating. Tiffany, I'm going to give you the last word. Yes, yeah, so I, I think everything that we've mentioned here is is uh, deeply important. And I think what, what it comes down to, um, we're looking at really two things, the impact of these strategies on investment portfolios. Uh, do these strategies help investors become better investors, right? Um, and then also, um, as as a client um, or as, as an investor, are you trying to have impact? And I think when you keep those two things in mind and understand that they, they, um, they, they kind of work hand in hand, I think that ultimately you'll, you'll have some success. And so what we do is we look at things from a total portfolio perspective. Uh, that's a better process than necessarily sit, kind of slicing and dicing what we're going to put in the portfolio and what we're going to exclude from the portfolio. So we really collect the raw data on all metrics and we kind of make our own decision uh, about what's what's the most important thing. But looking at it from a total portfolio perspective uh, is, is just really um, impactful overall. So environment, social, and governance efforts, the ESG portfolio. Thank you all very much for helping to educate me and hopefully many others on this subject. It's one I find fascinating. And as I said, you know, I began, you know, I saw Judy Roden of the Rockefeller Foundation really invest in writing about this, helping to line up people to talk about impact investing years ago. And it's just become huge. It's just really like a light switch went off and has become huge. Thank you so much for helping to take us into some of the contours of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.